Thank you, George. George gave me an agenda, and he asked me to point out certain things that is in our manual. And the manual has been distributed. We call it the Purple Book, and um, I risk being reprimanded by by George, but I decided to rather talk on the complexities and the nuances of validation. That those things that you would not normally write down. <laughs> um, so, you know, on the 28th of August 2003, to this day, exactly 10 years ago, George Henderson stood on the podium on the, uh, at the auditorium of the Department of Law. And he said, I've still got the notes, <laughs> he said, we also validate diversity. He went on to say that we've got to establish a balance between principles and prescriptive standards, and a lot of other things besides that, which I've, which I've kept. <laughs> so, you know, they say once you reinvent oneself every 10 years, maybe the, the time has come for, for our validation process. So I'm looking forward to, to what George has to say. But what is important about this diversity is when we went to uh, the University of Pretoria last year, Carl said within five minutes, he said, listen guys, we don't train technologists, we train candidate architects, which is fine, but he made his position clear. It doesn't mean he can ignore all the other competencies, but his emphasis is different. The difference is that he declared it up front and he defined it properly. And this uh, diversity, based on all the geographic and socioeconomic and cultural uh, realities, is, is totally acceptable because what we want is a flexible, pragmatic and responsive system. And that is what the collaboration with the CIA allows us. Because remember, they were the first people who said, we mustn't be dogmatic about this all. So we've got an agreement, a joint uh, SACAP CIA validation agreement, which was renewed last year after we met certain conditions. And that agreement will be uh, running for the next three years. And, you know, very often, and I have to say that, when we say Commonwealth Association of Architects, people refer to some sort of colonial legacy. And it, it, is, it is true, but if you look at the map, the, old, the Commonwealth covers most of the English-speaking world. It's a huge chunk of the globe, except America. But then we've got to argue, do the Americans speak English? So we draw in a lot of people through the Commonwealth uh, 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 links. Most of the Anglophone world, and there are so many commonalities in culture, language, of course. It makes communication and logistics so easy. Uh, the architectural courses are very, very similar, which make interchangeability so much easier. And the CIA partnership brings cultural diversity too. And the heads of schools will testify. On the, on the visiting boards, we've had representatives from um, Obviously, Namibia, Botswana, Nigeria, Kenya a couple of times, um, Mark Raymond from Trinidad, even sometimes from the UK. But, and this makes it so, so rich and interesting. Then somebody must ask us at some stage, why do we call it the Purple Book? Simply because there was already a green book and a red book and we sat around the table and Aura had a purple nail polish on. We said, that's it. Very, very simple and mundane. And when we, we've been revising this, and I've got to thank David Yu, who did the original, let's say, framework. There was considerable input from the CIA, people like Yaku. And then, of course, our recent experience, not all of it positive, we, we, one also learns from, from bad experiences and flaws, and we try to, to fix that. I want to talk about the composition of a visiting board. Currently, our arrangement is for two academics and four practitioners. And you know, we can never please everybody, because some people say we should only have practitioners, others say we should only have academics, because they only 
we, we decided to stick to this. The ideal is, of course, to have an academic with practice experience, to have people like that on board. Um, we had a student representation at some stage, third year, fourth year, it didn't work. It didn't work. So it, it cost us an awful lot of money. So in future, what we want is a recent graduate um, to, to go around with us. And then also, it was a criticism from the CAA that we, you know, the, the, the visiting board should not be, be uh, uh, comprised of external examiners. But in South Africa, the community is so small that we don't have a choice. So what comes into play is integrity. And I think everybody's come to accept that now, that when we go to a school, we uh, go there as, as, as a responsible body. And there's no, no uh, favoritism or anything. Then we currently have a, a four-year cycle, and I promise the heads of schools, George, that I will discuss with you and Yaku, there is this notion that every second visit should be slightly more streamlined, quicker, and cheaper. But like I said, we'll discuss it so that we have a, a streamlined system that we all agree on. And our model for that is, is the engineering system. They've got something worked out, and we are not too proud that we don't learn from other, from other disciplines. Then I want to talk about a couple of rules for, for visiting boards that we don't write up. The one is that the pre-meeting, that meeting that is always scheduled for the evening beforehand, is compulsory. And I want to say now, if a board member cannot attend, he or she mustn't come. Because that is where the ideology and, and the chairperson's culture is, is established. And also the roles. And wherever we've had a loose cannon, it was somebody who didn't attend the pre-meeting. So please, if you accept an invitation to join a visiting board, you, you, you contract with SACAP and with a school. And if you cannot meet all your obligations, you must pull out in time. You owe that to, to the system. Then, of course, time management is um, critical. It's vital. We've only got so much time and so much ground to cover. And there's nothing as disastrous as an out-of-control visiting board. If the visiting board chair decides to look at, at portfolios until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, it's fine. But don't keep external examiners waiting. Don't keep students waiting. Be punctual for the interviews. After hours, you can work through the night on, on writing and, and looking at portfolios. But don't keep people uh, waiting because it's unprofessional and it's sloppy and it's, it's bad manners. Um, then. When the time schedule is set out, there is this notion that we want to have tea and spend an hour with the rector. It's awkward for them and it's awkward for us. We want to get down to the portfolios and interview the stakeholders, the lecturers and the students. Don't give us too much time with the DVC and all those people because the, it's, it's, it, it, it is really not quite appropriate. That's not why we're there. Um, then the other thing that I've, I've, I haven't noticed, it, it hasn't occurred that many times, but I've got to mention it. Because you've got a captive audience, you've got the lecturers and the students sitting there, they are vulnerable because the, the visiting board is the, 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 the body with the power. You've got a captive audience. Don't abuse it to lecture to them. I've seen that because, and then the people, I can see them warming to all these confirming nods of agreement. Don't preach to the lecturers. If you've got something to say, put it in your report. The visiting board is there to probe and investigate and question. The judgment and the opinions can come at a later stage. Um, then the meeting with the staff, you know, it used to be tradition to have it without the head, head, uh, head of the department. I don't think that's appropriate anymore. If we want to look at the quality of the qualification. And every time we talk to the, heads, to the, to the staff without the heads, it's, a, it's the same problem. They, they, they complain about, to, about the, 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 the lack of parking, the per, lack of perks, the overloading of work, 
and, and that sort of thing. And that's not what we, we want to, to talk about. We want to talk about the cause. Let the CHE talk about perks and parking and pay and that sort of thing. Then the other thing that we are absolutely adamant, and if people don't do that, that is what landed us in trouble with CIA in the first place, is late reporting and bad reporting and sloppy reporting. That's where things started to go wrong. You know, a, a chair of a visiting board told me once that we're not going to tell this school, we're not going to tell them what the bottom line is, what our findings are, because then we can't change our mind later. The, needless to say, the report only came about nine months later because they were debating the basic issues. That is not acceptable. That is totally out. On departure, the visiting board will put in writing their findings to the school. Ideally, one should deliver the whole report. We did that with Socarl. 12 o'clock the next day, he had his report. But uh, that, that's difficult because it's, that's, that's an expensive exercise. But uh, the least is a written statement with all the pertinent concerns. Let's uh, all the things that are worrying and that need strong recommendations to, to, to fix must be put in writing, there and then. And the visiting board can't change its mind and add things later on. Those are the issues. And uh, they must be very, very clear and, and with that. Then, I must tell you that at one stage, I think all the, all the schools, all the ALSs were at conditional validation. Because there was this idea that, listen, if we give them conditional validation, it will prompt the university management to do more for them. That's nonsense. It, this, it damaged the reputation of those ALSs in the eyes of their management. If it's not broken, if the system works, if the qualifications are acceptable, um, unconditional validation, and we can write strong recommendations to fix things. But it, at, at some stage it got really bad. Some schools got unconditional validation because the auditorium was too small. You know, that sort of thing. And that, it, it really was ridiculous. Thank heavens, we've, I think we've sorted that out. Then when the, f uh, the final report, we've got a secretary. It's a secretary's responsibility to collate the views from the various visiting board members. And with the templates that, or the template that is available, I cannot see why it should take anybody, a secretary, longer than two or three days to compile a report. Then it gets circulated for, for uh, uh, basic fundamental views to see that we've got the, 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 the basic ideas right. And then it goes for professional editing. Because a report with spelling mistakes and grammar is, is, is obviously totally unacceptable. And that, George, is, is it. Thank you very much.